So I'll admit, this is a siege of, uh, shall we say, philosophical import or philosophical trope. Philosophy! Sadly, I, I don't have any ships, so uh, very sorry. There is some science, though. Don't worry, don't worry. There's, it's, there's invention, so there is science. So the beginning of motion pictures is somewhat has its own questionable beginnings. The Zotrope was created by Edward Moybridge to settle a bet by Governor Leland Stanford about if all four hooves of the horse left the ground. So essentially, you have an entire mode of human expression that starts off a bet from a rich guy. <laughs> what can go wrong after that? When you start off with that, really, what can go wrong? So the Zotrope continues on. It's a lovely curiosity. And it, of course, very quickly becomes a scientific medium. This is an anatomical study, not pictures of a nude woman or almost nude woman. See the lines? That means it's scientific. Science. So from these somewhat illicit to questionable at best beginnings, we end up with someone who legitimately wants to have skin in the game, wants the glory of bringing this to everyone, and wants everyone to see what movies can bring, what the moving pictures can do. Not the talking pictures yet, just the moving pictures. We enter Thomas Edison. Uh, I'll try and be objective, but let's face it, the guy's kind of a scumbag. Any of you from New Jersey, apparently he's idolized like a god if you're from New Jersey. No? Okay, good, then I can trash New Jersey for the next 10 minutes. Great. <laughs> you, you are my people. You are my audience. So Edison is here with George Eastman of Eastman Kodak. They, Eastman comes up with the idea because, come on, you need to come up with a way of making money off this newfangled exciting thing. Who cares about what it can do? How do I make money off of it? Does this sound familiar to stuff that happens around this geographical area at all? No, no, you know, Bueller, Bueller, nobody, okay. So Edison comes up with a wall of patents. And a lot of the way that he does this is based on the light bulb. Because if you invented the light bulb, you like patents. Because they are the easiest way of lobbing people over the head and getting money out of them. It's not a protection racket, it's law. <laughs> so this was the natural way of making a wall for him. This was his city. He was going to make the beautiful movie studio and film business center in New Jersey. More patents. The patents just go on and on and on. And they all look a lot the same, which is the funny part. All of the patents for movie cameras look a lot the same. For those of you falling asleep, don't worry. This is not entirely a lecture about patent law. <laughs> I, I'd like to stay awake for the rest of the night. So this is what's called the Latham Loop. And this was the first time when the, the phrase of it's the flicks, you go and see a flick, was because the prior projector had a slit and it was mistimed, so the picture would flat out go black between frames. The Latham loop was the first time that you could actually get the film to stop in place, and your persistence of vision would make it look like the magical thing that it was. Somehow, that something moves that doesn't move at all. Your brain's lying to you. Sorry to tell you all that. <laughs> Here we have William Dickinson, who worked for Edison. This is a still of him from Dickinson's Greetings, which was the first movie ever shown to any large amount of people. It's about eight seconds long, and it pretty much consists of him doing that. <laughs> he is why we can, he is who we can thank for that we have 35 millimeter film. He got 70 millimeter film, which was an existing film size, split it in half, and they used to make the perforations on it with a punch that was foot operated. So every single thousand foot roll of film involves some guy loading in a thing, Hitting a thing, moving at five feet, hitting a thing. That's how they perforated film to start off with. The patent company pretty much includes all the big players. Because, you know, if you have patents, you want all of the evil people in one place. I mean, all of the interesting, talented people in one place. This seems like a great idea. Edison will make all the money there is to be made in film. 
Here's the problem. He approaches it like he's making light bulbs. They're all the same. They're realities. I kid you not, that's what they were called. And they were about as interesting as a lot of reality television now, which is to say, not at all. People walking into a room, greeting each other, having a cup of tea, the, the coasts, the, uh, the, raw, the waves on the coast. And they shoot most of these things to start off with in the Black Maria. I mean, come on, doesn't that look like an architecturally inspired building <laughs> that will create nothing but timeless masterpieces? They're notable, not just because they're the first thing that happens. We end up with the great kiss of 96, not Titanic. This was protested all across the country. It was salacious. It was the degradation of morals. And Edison said this couldn't happen. That was too exciting. <laughs> really, that's what he said. So we also end up, so we end up with things like Jack and the Beanstalk. As you can tell, this is completely what ILM owes their heritage to. It's completely not two guys in a suit, right? No, no, not possible. So here's the thing. In order to enforce these patents, they controlled the amount of supplies you could buy, they controlled what you could do with them, and they controlled what you could say with them. Even though you paid for all the things, they got to tell you what it was you did with it. That's never happened since then. <laughs> but really, really, don't squeeze the bag. The dragons, the dragons will come out of the bag bad things will happen. Nothing can go wrong. Here was the biggest problem. The films just sucked. They were boring. They were interesting in that they were curiosities, but they just weren't that interesting. And after you'd seen the same one about 20 times, you didn't really want to go back. And the theater owner who had rented them, because you could only rent, not buy, said, well, we did just something else for me. You know, what about that one with the pretty girl with the curly hair? Oh no, you have to get this one next because that's what we say you get. That didn't work out real well for the theater owners. So they started getting things from Europe to fight the complete boredom they had in their theaters. Now we enter California. As Lucius Beebe said, the nut house run by the inmates. California's walls of defense include Siberia, the French Alps, the Wyoming ranches, the Kentucky mountains, the Red Sea, and the Sahara Desert. There is no way Edison's men are getting out here. Absolutely no way. This, though, is actually a 1910 map of Paramount telling you what you could fake. I, it, it, yeah, it actually is. Sherwood Forest, England seems a little off. I mean, you could kind of phone it in, but eh, whatever. So. Here's the thing, you get to California, it's 1900. Badges, we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> California has a much more lax approach to the issue of patents. The independents take advantage of this. The Ninth Circuit Court, which you'll recognize from just at Mission Street, plays into this. Mostly because, I kid you not, this starts off in a series of cases about the twine you, the way you wrap twine around brooms. They kind of got this, uh, patents, whatever. And they just became the, yeah, we're not going to really deal with that. So there we go. You end up with a place that has a somewhat soft, soft place for you to land that's far away from Edison. Note the taunting devil-like figure. <laughs> this company ends up becoming universal. It starts off at IMP, works to Nestor, it works, in, and you'll see in tiny type there, Universal Films, which apparently came from that he saw a pipe fitting truck that said Universal Pipe Fittings drive by as someone asked him what the name of his studio was. <laughs> Edison, of course, was never glib about anything. He would never, ever announce the, uh, his triumph of, an, of a foe. <laughs> at all. Wouldn't happen. And of course, this is where we end up where the story gets a bit foggy. Because these are people who make up stories and lie for a living, essentially. They build Universal City, partly as a way of getting around the patent trust, partly as their own small walled city. 
which to this day, by the way, it's mostly an unincorporated Los Angeles County, so they don't have to deal with planning or city taxes in the city of Los Angeles to this day. <laughs> this is Colonel Selig. You'll notice, by the way, he has much better props. He even lets them smoke. I mean, that's questionable these days. But back then, that was, you know, you're nice to your gorilla. Exactly, I was progressive. Selig starts off in Chicago, ends up in California. His camera, this is his camera department when they got out to Los Angeles. Their easiest way of skirting the patents were that they kept a lot of extra cameras around so that when Edison's men showed up, the ones that they hadn't supposedly chased off with guns from the train station, they would just swap out the cameras or the guts of the cameras looked like they were a camera that didn't infringe but were. And if it got really bad, they just loaded all the stuff on the back of a horse and shipped it to Mexico for the weekend. <laughs> Problem solved. Selig ends up opening up a zoo, incidentally, in East Los Angeles, and he wants to open up an amusement park and rides, and essentially he makes a rough sketch for Disneyland in about 1915. He ends up losing all of his money in the Depression. This is William Fox, who was at the forefront of, quite frankly, sieging Edison and just generally pissing the guy off. He did this mostly by creating this lovely vamp, Theta Berra, who was Theosodia Goodman, and gave Fox the money to fight Edison's lawyers. Here's where the story gets really foggy. This story is always told as the siege of California upon Edison, and they did win. There are questionable, long-standing effects to this, Fox News. But this is where the story gets foggy. Cecil B. DeMille's first film was unsurprisingly a Western, which by the way, Westerns didn't get a lot of play in Europe. Kind of a selling problem. He was so scared, he said, of Edison's men, he became a lifelong gun nut. How much was this permitted? Paramount Studios had a gun shop in it, a gun rental shop, until 1986. <laughs> when they ran out of space. That's the only reason why it left. And also less westerns. Universal continues to expand their repertoire, as does Fox. The wide selection of films gets wider and wider to what we know as the lovely things you can get today in cinematic entertainment. But Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm looking at you still. The court in the long run overturns the button fastener case, which was about shoe button fasteners, and how they gave you the machine to put together the button fasteners but you had to buy the fasteners themselves from the button fastener company. Well, the court overturns this, and the Motion Picture Patent Trust, which was already dying its last gasp because, Jack and the Beanstalk, I'm looking at you, <laughs> came to an end. Edison, always trying to save face, or at least seem like the great American inventor that he was, always happy to be a part of technology, in 1924, when Universal Studios had its first electric soundstage, he came to the grand opening because he did invent the light bulb after all. <laughs> so, to changing the story, to not quite telling the, what the truth is, but to what is at least the good story, don't let the facts get in the way, and to California, we raise a glass. California.